The pharaonic dynasties of Egypt left a wealth of temples and burial tombs along the Nile Valley in Upper Egypt. Most have since been restored. The Temple of Philae, however, is the only one to have been completely relocated, stone by stone. Philae is an island, and since the first Aswan Dam, constructed by the British in 1894, caused the water levels to rise and form a reservoir, the island is now flooded for 10 months in every 12. The temples and other structures on the island were either partially or fully submerged by water for most of the year. In 1960, under the direction of President Nasser, work began on the second Aswan Dam. The new project constituted a further threat to Philae, which would now be stranded between two dams. Plans of how to save the site were discussed, and the chosen solution was similar to that which had been employed at Abu Simbel a few years earlier, dismantling the ruins and reconstructing them on a site about 300 meters away, Agikia Island. In the ancient town of Philae, there was a temple dedicated to Isis. Its construction was begun by Nectanebo I, one of the first Egyptian pharaohs, and finished by the Romans. The temple was dedicated to the cult of the goddess and attended by the Nubian community until the mid-sixth century, when Emperor Justinian ordered it to be transformed into a Coptic church. Isis was the mother goddess of the Egyptian cult. She was woman, wife, and universal mother, goddess of marriage and of children. As a magician who had brought her husband Osiris back from the dead, she was seen as a healer and protector of children. The first courtyard, leading up to the first pylon of the Grand Temple of Isis, contains a number of different structures. On the right, an unfinished portico from the Roman era, made up of a facade of 16 columns, leads to a series of minor sanctuaries dedicated to Arsenufis, Mandulis, and Inmotep. The southwestern side of the esplanade was enlarged during the Ptolemaic era. Walls were built on top of the rocks at the edge of this side of the island to make chambers which were filled with earth and loose stones, and then covered with paving stones. Then, under Emperor Augustus, work was started to transform this open terrace into a closed courtyard, bordered by a 32-column portico with a series of intricate capitals. A number of external windows were set into the wall. As for the cornice, it was decorated with images of solar disks and vultures spreading their wings. Eighteen meters tall, the first pylon stood at the entrance to the temple's sacred enclosure. It was Nectanebo I's grand gateway, topped with a winged disc and decorated with a series of depictions of offerings featuring Horus, Hathor, and Isis that was badly damaged during the Christian era. It was during the Ptolemaic era that the cults of Isis and Osiris started to spread southwards. Later, when Egypt was almost entirely Christian, the cult was maintained on the island and Philae became one of the last refuges for followers of the ancient faith. The second pylon is slightly smaller and does not light parallel to the first. 
The haphazard layout of the Sanctuary of Isis is due to the irregular rocky terrain on which it stands. The second pylon is 30 meters wide and 14 meters high. The king officiates before Horus and Isis on the eastern tower, and a version of the decree of the god Ra is carved into the stone. In this decree, Ra declares his decision to the Divine Council. He announces that the god Horus is to be the designated successor of his father Osiris. In the courtyard, a granite block embedded at the foot of the tower juts out from the wall, creating a monumental steel. It is inscribed with a description of a land donation made by Ptolemy VI to the Temple of Isis. The text attributes to Isis, to its Temple of Philae and to its clergy, the commercial use of the area of land situated immediately south of the first cataract, on both banks of the Nile. The second courtyard is bordered on the western side by the Mamisi, dedicated to Isis the Ancient, and to the east is a colonnade which opens on to five rooms, including the library and the laboratory where they mixed perfumes. The central door in the second pylon leads to the holiest area of the building and opens on to the hypostyle hall. This room is lit by an opening in the ceiling at the back of the second pylon. According to the traditional layout of an Egyptian temple, behind the second pylon there should be a room lined with a colonnade, followed by the pronaos and then the hypostyle hall. Here the narrowness of the space available forced the architects to adapt the layout, combining the pronaos and the hypostyle hall, which was only two rows of columns. The ten columns are richly decorated with scenes of worship and offerings. This was a tribute to Isis the most beautiful goddess of all. On one of the columns is the cartouche of Cleopatra II. And despite what some guides might claim, there are absolutely no cartouches of Cleopatra VII, the one with the big nose. During the Roman period, and with evangelization, Emperor Justinian officially banned the cult of Isis at Philae. The temple and hypostyle hall were transformed into a church, and the walls and pillars were covered with Coptic crosses. The Coptic church was established after a disagreement in the 4th century between the Egyptian Christian church and the Catholic church. The Holy of Holies, the most secret part of the temple, bathed in shadow. Greatly complex, it comprises 12 rooms and a crypt. The rooms are all ornaments with liturgical scenes and scenes of offerings related to the myth of Isis and Osiris. The reliefs of the Naus depict the many aspects of the myth of Osiris.
all around the base are images of the Egyptian fertility gods. The sanctuary itself is located at the back, in one of the central rooms. The Naus, which houses the statue of the goddess. You can still see the pedestal for Isis's bark, made of red granite. Here, once again, the walls are literally covered with the magnificent ritual scenes. The lithic art of Philae at its best. In the beginning, Osiris ruled the Nile with his sister and wife Isis. Osiris was a good, wise king, and Egypt prospered. But Isis and Osiris had a jealous brother, Set, the king of the desert, who wanted to take the place of Osiris. One night, Set invited Osiris and Isis to dinner and brought out a magnificent sarcophagus, promising to give it to the one who could fill it. Several nobles tried without success. Then came Osiris's turn, and he laid down in the sarcophagus, hardly imagining that it had been designed specifically for his dimensions. The treacherous Set closed his brother in the sarcophagus and threw it in the Nile. Isis left to search for her husband. Her voyage led her to the palace of King Byblos across the seas. She brought her husband's corpse back to Egypt and kept it hidden but Set discovered it, cut it into 14 pieces, and dispersed them in the Nile. Isis, persevering, found them all, and after having put the pieces of her husband back together, she brought the body back to life. The god Horus was born from this love. Since that day, Isis cries every year for the death of her husband, and legend has it that the Nile floods because it is full of her tears. This site is exceptionally rich. The Temple of Isis is surrounded by a number of other constructions. The Coptic church, of which very little is left standing, reminds us of other past events. The Trajan kiosk has been very well preserved. The last of the structures built on the island, this pavilion, designed in the form of a rectangular portico, was started in the year 100 AD, but was never finished. There are no bas-reliefs or inscriptions here. The Trajan Kiosk is the most famous of the monuments of Philae because it was the only one that stood above the water when the island was flooded before the move. Visitors approaching the island from the south are greeted by the goddess Hathor, whose effigy stands above the capitals of the pavilion of Nectanebo I. The presence of Hathor, goddess of fertility and love, recurs in various locations across the island. Hathor is one of the principal divinities. It is possible that she once shared Philae with Isis, but that during the late period, Isis somehow became more important in the eyes of the worshippers. To the east of the Temple of Isis, Ptolemy VI, the father of the famous Cleopatra, built a small sanctuary for Hathor. Its construction and decoration was continued by the Roman Emperor Augustus. This modest building indicates that Hathor was a persistent presence on the island of Isis. On the columns, animals are shown playing musical instruments, while the god Bess, protector of love and childbirth, dances and plays a tambourine. Basically, Philae was the temple of love. 
When faced with all of these marvels, it is easy to understand why this island has become one of the country's most popular tourist sites, drawing several thousand visitors a day in high season. Further downstream, 40 kilometers to the north of Aswan, is Komombo. From the Greek ombos meaning city of gold. A medium-sized town during the Pharaonic era, it grew into a substantial metropolis by the Ptolemaic era. Its temple became one of the most important in the Nile Valley. This temple was extended and replaced an older, smaller sanctuary, constructed more than 1,000 years earlier. A double wall was built, bringing all of the buildings into one enclosure. To this day, all of the walls and corridors of the temple are covered with reliefs, some of which still have traces of color. Unusually, the Komombo Temple is a double temple, dedicated to two distinct triads. That of Horus and that of Sobek, the crocodile god. Sobek is the god of water, charged with irrigating the crops. The presence of crocodiles in the Nile was a sign of high water levels which brought plentiful harvests. In those days, the crocodile was seen as a sacred animal. The present-day temple was built by the Ptolemies, but was extended and embellished many times during the Roman era. The courtyard, for example, was built by Tiberius, and the pylon by Domitian. Not much remains of these extensions because the erosion of the east bank has caused several structures to disappear completely. The embankment collapsed, as did the Mamisi. Part of the surrounding wall disappeared and the temple lost its roof. As for the pylon, it was severely damaged. It features scenes of Domitian making offerings to the gods. Going back towards the temple, we walk the length of the sanctuary wall, which is engraved with depictions of offerings and tributes, evidence of the country's wealth and power. Unusually, the Komombo temple was dedicated to the cults of two gods, both equally important, Horus, the falcon-headed god, and Sobek, the crocodile god. These two divine entities represented two of the elements essential to all life in Egypt. Sobek was connected with water and Horus with light. The whole temple is separated in two. The northern part is dedicated to Horus and the southern half to Sobek.
Each of the parallel halves of the monument has its own separate entrance, but they connect transversely. A complicated series of doors make it possible to isolate or connect the two sanctuaries for different occasions. Inside the sacred area, the first hypostyle hall has a facade which is decorated with the name of Ptolemy XII, surrounded by Toth and Horus in a purification scene. The ceiling is decorated with cosmographical representations and is supported by two rows of five latiform columns. The room, its columns and walls are entirely covered with scenes of worship, and all of the divinities of the site are featured. The second hypostyle hall has exactly the same layout as the first. And among the divinities depicted is the god Hathor. On leaving the hypostyle halls, we enter the three intermediary rooms or vestibules. At either end of the vestibules are two lateral rooms which probably contain the temple treasures and the stores of offerings. Depending on which side of the temple you are in, it is dedicated to either Sobek or Horus. As you approach the Holiest of Holies, the ceilings are covered with magnificent colored relics, here in honor of Horus. At the back of the temple, the two sanctuaries devoted to Horus and Sobek stand side by side. In fact, Kom Ombo was divided in two by an imaginary line, a religious and mystical barrier.
Continuing on down the Nile, in the eastern part of Luxor, formerly Thebes, stands the funeral temple of one of the greatest Egyptian pharaohs, Ramses II. The Ramesseum was a vast religious and economic complex. It contains a number of large relics, such as monumental gates, pylons, paintings, giant statues, bas-reliefs, as well as mud-brick storerooms and a sanctuary. The entrance pylon is about 22 meters tall and 70 meters wide. Only the internal facade of the pylon has been reconstructed. The central gate has been reconstructed and consolidated. On the side which is still visible, we see, among other things, a description of the Battle of Kadesh, a campaign led by Ramses II against the Hittites in the fifth year of his reign. The Ramesseum is an immense architectural complex spread over around five acres. It was built in 1277 BC. In the last 20 years, precise surveys of the buildings have been carried out, but only half the site has been excavated. With all these stones, the site has not been pillaged, but the colossi have been knocked down and the statues of Osiris damaged probably at the hands of the early Christians. It was Champollion, decipherer of the hieroglyphs, who gave it the name Ramesseum in the 19th century. Ramses II himself had referred to it as the Temple of Millions of Years. Ramses II ruled for 66 years, an incredibly long reign for that time. Like so many other great men whose fame has lasted through the centuries, Ramses II was apparently a great warrior and conqueror. This reputation earned him the epithet of great in most of the historic records, which refer to this period of ancient Egypt. Ramses II is also considered, rightly or wrongly, to have been Pharaoh at the time of Moses and the Exodus. That said, there is no archeological proof to confirm this, and his name does not ever appear in the Torah. As well as the many monuments that he had erected throughout the country, he also commissioned a number of sculptures of himself, and had his name engraved in many temples, including those of other pharaohs, as though he had been responsible for their construction himself. The combined effect of all these elements, archaeological data and the strength of collective memory, has been to make Ramses II into one of the most famous pharaohs known throughout the world. Near the entrance to the sanctuary, a pink granite statue of pharaoh lies in pieces on the ground. It must have been about 18 meters tall. This colossal statue, one of the largest in the country, weighing roughly 1,000 tons, is visible from outside the temple. The Colossus represents the two facets of the king, human and divine. The Colossus had a religious purpose, a symbol of the king's divine status. A Greek man called Diodore de Sicile was the first to discover this site in the first century BC. He described the site, and particularly the second colossal statue of Tuyi, the mother of Ramses II. But that was before the arrival of Christianity in the area. Since then, explorers never managed to find the scattered remains of the statue. Today, after a number of excavation campaigns and surveys, a team has started work on the reconstruction of this colossus before starting on that of Ramses II himself. The Ramesseum has a number of hypostyle halls, and the columns and architraves within them have maintained much of their original coloring. Here we find references to the cult of Ammon. 
the cult grew up around the area of Thebes during the era thanks to the clergy, who built up his status, endowing him with the power of a universal god by bestowing on him the functions of other gods. Gradually, Amon replaced Ra as the dynastic god, and he took the form of Amun-Ra, appropriating the characteristics of the sun god. The use of color in these temples was exceptional. Ramses II was also a great theologian. He relaunched the initiative started by Akhenaton to popularize the sun cult, but without destroying the traditional cults. While he developed a religion around his own person, which could transcend frontiers and bring together the various peoples under his reign, he still, however, actively supported the temples of the great gods of the empire, Amon, Ra, Ta, and Osiris. He treated the temples and religious cults everywhere with great favor. The alignment of the various hypostyle halls with the sanctuary would undoubtedly have lent a certain mystical majesty to the complex. Advancing toward the shrine, we see the life of Ramses II, who died at 90 years old on the walls, his family, his coronation, his political power, and his wars. Notably, the hieroglyphs represent the war with the Hittites, the civilization that extended from modern-day Turkey to Syria, and the Battle of Kadesh. This battle was the first to be documented by antique sources. It was the object of an impressive commemoration by Ramses II who saw it as a personal victory, even if it wasn't really a success for his kingdom. The result of the battle is disputed because it remains unclear. Even though the battle started strongly for the Hittites, it ended in a reversal in favor of the Egyptians. But while if he won the battle, in the end Ramses saw his country lose the war if you take into account the territorial gains the Hittites obtained after the conflict, he would at least win peace. The battle took place around 1274 BC in the south of modern-day Syria. The pharaoh's shock troops were made up of companies of light two-wheeled chariots pulled by two horses and ridden by two soldiers, one driver and one archer, who could also use other arms in case of close combat. There were several thousand chariots to launch the first offensives before the infantry took up the relay. It is clear that Ramses II saw the Battle of Kadesh as a founding event for his reign, a true trial by fire against his greatest rival. The pharaoh was only in the fifth year of his reign at the time. On the other wall, Ramses II is being crowned by Amon. He receives the attributes of divine power. The foundation, as this site is known, provided a living here for more than 3,000 people. A full-scale town grew up around the temple with housing, schools, administration, and commerce. Hangers made of bricks stand as a testament to that sumptuous era. These are the oldest vaulted arches in the world still standing.
we see it project after project, the history of the Ramesseum becomes clearer. But its restoration can never replace either the statues and stones that have disappeared, nor the sacred images and the history that they embodied. Iconoclasts of all kinds, be they Christian or Muslim, have destroyed, or tried to destroy, the mystical aspirations of the civilizations without which humanity would never have achieved what it has today. Close by, the colossal site of Karnak is one of the largest religious complexes in the world, with an incredible architectural diversity. Situated on the right bank of the Nile River, to the north of Luxor, the complex extends over two square kilometers. The complex, classified as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, is made up of a number of temples which are grouped into three separate enclosures. In former times, there was a landing jetty to which tugboats and vessels used for the animal grand ceremonies on the Nile would moor. The jetty extends into the dromos. This is a processional alleyway. On either side are cryosphinxes, and between their legs are statuettes, which originally bore the names Tutmosis IV and Amenhotep III. Ramses II had them replaced with his own name. To pass through the enclosure wall, you have to go through the first pylon, which leads into the first courtyard. In a site of this sort, where time and space gradually start to blur, archaeologists struggle to unravel the puzzle, to understand which of the stones from the ancient monuments have been reused and where. Here and there, we find the ruins of two small temples, a courtyard, or even more ancient monuments. Of the many buildings of the complex, only a few remain. A triple bark shrine for the barks of Amun-Ra, Mut, and Khonsu, attributed to Seti II, and the remains of a kiosk, that of Tarko, a Nubian pharaoh of the 7th century BC. The 21-meter column, which stood in the center of the courtyard, is the last remaining trace of the kiosk, which once had ten papriform pillars connected by stone architraves supporting a simple wooden floor. Pharaoh's sacred bark was kept under this. The second pylon is preceded by a vestibule in front of which stood colossal statues in pink granite. One was usurped by Pinijim, a high priest who later became Pharaoh but it is actually thought to date back to the era of Ramses II, the golden age of the temple. The left-hand statue is 15 meters high, and at its feet stands another smaller statue showing Pharaoh's wife or daughter. At the back of the great courtyard stands the second pylon. It is about 100 meters wide and close to 30 meters tall. Undertaken by Horemheb in around 1300 BC, with some of the stone coming from an earlier structure in the Akhenaton, construction of the second pylon was completed by Ramses II, and its decoration by Ramses III. It was restored and extended 1000 years later during the Ptolemaic period. Like the Temple of Seti II, the Temple of Ramses III was built well before the construction of the final external wall of the site of Karnak. At the time, it stood outside of the religious complex. On the facade, we see a depiction of the king massacring his defeated enemies, as well as an image of the god Amon, to whom the temple is dedicated. 
The entrance to the temple is by way of the small pylon framed by two royal colossi. The building is made up of a courtyard surrounded on three sides by a peristyle decorated with 16 statues of the pharaoh. Besides the courtyard, the temple of Ramses III consists of a vestibule, a hypostyle hall, and three chapels intended to house the sacred barks of the triad of Amun. The god Amun resided in the temple of Karnak, but would travel every year to the nearby temple of Luxor for 10 days around the feast of Opet. The god would be placed inside a bark and carried by the priests from one temple to the other. The Opet was the country's most important religious festival and attracted a considerable crowd. The most majestic part of the Temple of Amun is the Hypostyle Hall, located between the second and third pylons. It resembles a gigantic papyrus thicket carved in stone. Originally, it would have been covered by a roof, with light filtering in through latticed windows, some of which are still in place. The inscriptions are still visible on the columns, most of which are still standing an incredibly rich source of information for historians. The columns are perfectly aligned on the central axis of this immense hall, 103 meters long and 53 meters wide. The columns were roughly 23 meters tall. They increase from a circumference of 10 meters to 15 meters at the top where the capitals open up into flowers. The supports for the side aisles are 15 meters tall with a circumference of about eight meters. In other words, lots of space for text. The inscriptions on the columns recount the sagas and exploits of several pharaohs. Engraved into the stone, they are there for all to read, the challenge is deciphering them. The cult of the sun, very popular in ancient Egypt, was focused around Amun, the god of Thebes, a new god, and one of the most important of the Egyptian pantheon. His name means the hidden or a noble one because it was impossible to know his true form. He appeared in a wealth of different guises. Certain legends claim that he fertilized the cosmos with his own semen. Amon became the national god as he was the force that unified Egypt. And it is said that the gods prostrated themselves at his feet like dogs when they sensed the presence of their lord. The priests of the Egyptian temples observed the cult of Amun here at Karnak. In the time of Tutmosis I and Tutmosis II, the area beyond the third gateway was the forecourt of the Temple of Amun, with a monumental pylon, the fourth, and two pairs of obelisks. The obelisk, which is still standing, the work of Tutmosis I, is an immense block of monolithic granite, 22 meters high and weighing around 140 tons. The other monoliths were pulled down and transferred to the major cities of the Roman Empire, where they were shattered by earthquakes. Then, after a string of rooms, some better preserved than others, we arrive at the Holy of Holies. The chapel altar of Amun-Ra was built during the Greek era in the 4th century BC. It replaced another identical one in pink granite, which was probably severely damaged. It opens on to the divine axis at both ends, at the height of his popularity. 
Amon was associated with Ra, the sun god, forming the cosmic god Amon-Ra, the eternal, the lord of Karnak, and creator of all things, who exists permanently in all things. Cradle of civilization and its lifeblood, the Nile carries within its banks a whole segment of the history of humanity. So many areas are yet to be excavated, and it is impossible to compile a full inventory of the objects and buildings which line its shores. There are still a wealth of mysteries to be solved, and projects that will no doubt open up whole new pages of Egyptology, and perhaps even rewrite the history of antiquity.